this in the morning, in the evening, or at night. This is Mr. Fixie here, and I just wanted to say good night, scientists. Just teasing. Good morning, scientists. I'm glad to have you here with me. Um, so today I want to go through a little bit of information and just some slides um, and talk about a scientific method. Um, it's just a way to solve a problem. There are multiple different ways to solve problems, and we can always find new ways to solve problems, especially because our problems are more and more diverse every day. Um, but we're just going to talk about a couple of steps and a couple of uh, one specific way that we can use to solve a problem. Um, and all these materials, these slides, all the information I'm about to give to you was given to me by uh, the great Mr. Will Banks, uh, fantastic science teacher and fantastic scientist. So um, thank you, Mr. Will Banks, for your help here in Mr. Vixie's seventh grade science class. So without further, further ado, what is a scientific method? Well, the scientific method is steps or you've probably heard of a the scientific method before I even start talking about this. You've probably heard of the scientific method, right? That might be something that you learned in elementary school or something you've uh, picked up along the way. But we're talking about a scientific method. We've talked about a couple of processes and a couple of skills that we use in science all the time. But we, and now in our class, and from here on out, we're not going to think about one specific method of science because there's not just one. Right? We've got tons and tons of different things, but this a scientific method, any scientific method, is the steps that a scientist is going to take to identify a question, develop a hypothesis, design and carry out steps or procedures to test their hypothesis, to document their, ex their observations, and to share it with somebody else. Or just in general, it's a way to solve a problem. When we look through those steps, a question, hypothesis, procedures, um, observations, communications, we just see all of our common key skills. Communication, observation, uh, sorry, classifying, observation, measuring, inferences, communication, and experimenting. All of our common key skills make, uh, make their uh, debut in our scientific method. So, Really, at the end of the day, scientists have to take time to think logically about why they're investigating or what their question or what their problem is. All right, there's no one way to do it. We just need to stop and think about, okay, what's the problem? What's our question? And then once we've gotten some time to think about these things and really give it a good thought, that's when we can start to break our problems down into steps. And we can really make sense of our problem or really make sense of a question once we've broken it down into those steps. All right, if we look at it, as an overarching problem, it can be intimidating and sometimes there doesn't seem like the right way to go. But if we break it down into steps or into a method, uh, then we can start to see the science play out and we can start to uh, make our findings from that. So scientists first develop questions, right? Sometimes you see something, you see a phenomenon we, that lead us to a question. Why is something the way that it is? Why does something happen the way that it does? When I drop two objects, why do they fall to the earth at the same rate regardless of their mass? We have these things that we see, these observations that we make. We ask questions about them. And once we have a question, we can start to gather information and then form a hypothesis or an idea for what we think. We can start to make a prediction or an inference for what might be, might be the answer to our question. So once we have a hypothesis, once we've started to make observations, most of the time we're going to want to run an experiment because those experiments we can use to test our hypothesis to make sure that it's right or to find out that it's wrong. Either way, we're doing science. If we're right or we're wrong, we're still committing to science, right? That's why we always say that if you're wrong, that's okay. If you don't know, that's not okay, right? If you're wrong, at least you know that something that doesn't work. If you didn't try in the first place, you don't, you're no better off. So scientists always just take steps to create and conduct experiments so they can learn something, even if they learn something that's wrong. At least they're, they know more than they did earlier. All right. So when we're running our experiment, we're always observing what's happening and we're writing things down. Right? Gathering information and gathering data is so reliable, and that's what we need to do. When we're documenting our information, we need to make sure it's readable and it makes sense so that we can communicate it to others. It's really important that all the information that we gather is readable and that it makes sense. 
thankfully most of the information that we take down now we're typing it so it's usually very readable um, but at the end of the day we need to make sure that all of our information makes sense because what good is our experiment what good is our knowledge if we can't share it with others so once we complete an experiment though it's not done you don't just do it once and say okay yep i'm good i got it we if you run an experiment you repeat your own experiment over and over and over because you try to prove yourself wrong you can't just take your first um take your first guess and go with it right you want to test over and over and over again so you are certain that you are right but even after that we need to always share it right because we need to make sure that we're consistent that's why we do it over and over and over because we need to do what we call verification or verify that our claim or that our findings are correct. We need to check to make sure that what we did was right and we didn't make mistakes along the way because everyone makes mistakes. Everybody has those days. As we go back through and verify and make sure that all of our information is valid and that it happens every single time, that's how we know we've committed to science and that we are doing it consistently. That means we know we have correct knowledge. However, we're biased people. We want to be right and we want our findings to prove what we no. So let's say uh, yeah. you're an ash astronomer and you're looking out into space and you think you see a planet, right? Yeah, that'd be awesome to discover a new planet. So you're probably thinking in the back of your head, yeah, this is probably a planet. This is probably a planet. Just because you want it to be, right? You want your finding to be true and you want it to be real. So after we make findings, we have to share it with others so that they can recreate it. That's why we sh we have all of our findings. We wrote really detailed procedures. We had really detailed ideas so that we can share what we learned with somebody else, right? We can't just have our knowledge and then just tell everybody that it's true. We need to allow other people to test it. It's okay if we're wrong. It's okay if we've tested it and then somebody else comes out with a new discovery that proves us wrong. That is fine. It's always okay to be wrong. It's not okay to fight for your opinion, right? It's all about fact. We care about fact, right? We often can use other people's experiences to help us, right? And that's how we get scientific consensus. And that's how we work together for science to be stronger overall, right? You may have heard these steps before, but in general, just some basic steps that scientists go through would be the question or identifying the question or the problem. And this is usually, surprisingly, one of the hardest steps along the way. Right. First, we have to think of a question or a problem. After we have that, we'll do some pre-lab research. Right. Before we even dive into anything or make any assumptions, we need to make sure we're gathering some knowledge. We're not going to just make our hypothesis shot in the dark. We need to do some research to gather some information behind our question or behind our problem. And then we'll make our hypothesis. Well, we've done a little bit of research. So what do we think is going to happen? When we go into this and we actually start diving into our problem or our question, what might happen? So we'll follow up the hypothesis with some procedure or some methods or how we're gonna go about determining this problem, solving this problem or answering this question. We'll make observations for what we can see. We'll run our experiment, run that procedure, run those methods, make observations along the way, collect some data and use that data and those observations for a conclusion. When science was first starting, and these, these steps, before they were even determined, we had Aristotle, the ancient Greek philosopher, who just knew things, right? He just, he just knew stuff. He was a philosopher. He thought, he thought a lot, and he thought really hard, right? He was one of the great thinkers of the world, and more than any other thinker, he determined the orientation and content of Western intellectual history. He was the author of so many... Um, different scientific systems and books and uh, throughout the centuries that supported all of our thoughts up until the 17th century, right? He was so influential that his thinking is still embedded and we still talk about him and he still influences how we think and how we operate even today. But that's fine. That's fine when Aristotle was right. But he made a lot of mistakes and he said a lot of things that were wrong and they were never challenged because Science wasn't, wasn't written out like it is now, right? So he, Aristotle and all his buddies believed they could just think about stuff. They could just think a problem and they could just think about it really, really hard. And 
and then they would they would figure it out right like he thought he thought really really hard about this and he thought heavy objects fall faster than light ones right and that makes sense if you think about something really heavy you think to yourself yeah that probably falls faster than something really light right but that's reasonable but it wasn't scientific because you know what he didn't do he didn't test it he just thought about it thought about it a lot and said this is true and everybody believed him just because he was a smart person and he thought a lot that just made his ideas the ones that everyone was going to go with but it was up and it wasn't until galileo galilei came along in the 7th or the late 16th to early 17th century in italy and actually did science he was the first real scientist right he actually carried out experiments and actually tested ideas that we had so take that idea about aristotle aristotle said yeah heavy things fall faster so galileo asked a question he asked questions about things that were widely accepted he said well if they fall faster how much faster do they fall because when i do it in front of my face i don't see it so he sent students to the top of buildings <laughs> to drop heavy objects and light objects at the same time. Then he had other students of his at the bottom to measure the difference in the time of them hitting the ground. Well, today we know this would happen, but to everyone's surprise at the time, every single time they did the test, the two balls hit the ground at the exact same time. And this shows that having an idea, that's cool, that's fine, but it's kind of worthless, right? Your idea is only good when you can start to test it. If you just think about an idea, that's that's just a dream, right? But if you act on it, that's what's important. In the words of Bill Nye, the science guy, one of the great scientists of our time, says one test is worth a thousand expert opinions. One test, one true experiment is worth a thousand expert opinions. It's pretty powerful. So, understand that when conducting an experiment, we need to change one variable or factor at a time. Everything else needs to say the exact same all the time. That one thing that we change is called the experimental variable, or the independent variable, or the manipulated variable. It's the thing that we change, but all other things need to stay the same, and they are considered controls. In Galileo's experiment, he excuse me, controlled the height that they were dropped, controlled the time that they were dropped, and controlled their shape and size. The only thing that he changed, the one independent variable, or the experimental variable, was the weight, right? He dropped them from the same height, they were the same size, they were just a different weight. So, again, you think about it, I put in a little graph here, it's kind of hard to read, sorry. Experimental variable is the one that you change, right? The dependent variable is the one that changes because of it. The controls are the things that stay the same. And the controlling variables are the ones that we keep consistent, right? So as we go through our steps, we state the problem, we make a hypothesis, we conduct an experiment, we record and analyze data, and then we make conclusions. And then we report it back to others so they can repeat and test our experiment. The hypothesis is our guess, our prediction. We use an if-then format. So if we drop a ball from a higher height, then it will bounce higher, right? That's what we did with our better bounce lab. If is the manipulative variable, and then is the responding variable. So with our last experiment, if we drop two balls of, this, of different weights, then they will hit the ground at the same time. And that's exactly what happened. So what, after we make our hypothesis, We'll go through and make some observations. We use all five senses to make two different types of observations. One we can make is a qualitative observation or ob observations about the qualities, color, shape, size, taste, sound, a blue sweater, laptop is smooth or dog looks shiny or soft, right? And then there's quantitative, which is all about numbers. How many? Always a number, always exact measurements. The room is eight meters across. Sarah's 141 centimeters tall or Sam weighs 450 newtons. From our observations, we can make inferences, which is the in interpretation of an event based on observations and our prior knowledge. And we can kind of push this into what we know now. So we'll put this into sixth grade terms, although we are seventh graders. It'll help us put terms that we know and everyone knows 
um, to help us out here. So if we, let's say we see somebody in the office and uh, you see the student leave crying and upset, we can make an inference that the student is upset because maybe they got in trouble, maybe they had detention or they're expelled, maybe they had family problems at home, maybe they're just not feeling good, maybe they had poor grades. Something is causing them to be upset, and that's where we make inferences. All we know is they're upset and they're crying. We don't know the reason behind it. Also in science, we have theories, right? A theory is different than in real life. A theory is not a guess. A theory is not a hypothesis, right? Everyday life, you might say that the detective has a theory about someone who robbed the bank. That's a guess. In science, a theory is an explanation, right? That's our first explanation is the theory. Right? It's the simplest explanation. It's one that followed our predictions and is tested. And so the theory of gravity, right? that is, um, it's never completely proven, but it's only unable to be disproved, right? So we never proved it to be true, but we have never, ever been able to disprove these things. So um, this is something that we're going to try in class. Unfortunately, you won't be able to try it at home without partners. And if you want to give it a, a read and try it with a partner, maybe uh, uh, Jake and Maglio, you guys can try it together. Um, give it a shot. <sighs> Sorry, that's been a little long video, but uh, this has been Mr. Fixie.